from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hi everybody. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Wow Report. Uh, I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder with James St. James. Hello, darling. Yay, oh my God. Tom Campbell. Hello, everyone. Hello, Fenton. Hello, James. And I'm very excited. We have a special guest this week, Seth Abramovich. Hey, guys. So excited Hello. to be here. Thank you for giving yeah. me something to do. Thank you for joining us again. This isn't your first time at the rodeo. No. My Seth, nobody time. ever comes back after being on the show. So I don't know what's happened to you. What kind of grave mistake have you made? Safe uh, distance. Safe distance. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thank Every, you. As you know, we count down the top 10 things that made us go. Wow. 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 And um, well, let's just jump into it, shall we? Uh, a number 10. Number 10. Seth, it's you, and uh, it happened in Hollywood, your amazing podcast. Thank you so much. Am I supposed to tell you what it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talk about it for a minute, because um, uh, this is your second season that you just sort of wrapped up. Yes. Um, and you, it, it's, you get to sort of interview, all, you go back in your childhood, you go back in your yeah. past, and you find the people who were sort of seminal in your uh, development. Yes. And you get, to, you get to sort of um, interview them and get to meet them, and it's just really fun. So tell me some of the people you had on this season. Oh my goodness. Uh, we had uh, David Mamet. Mm. Um, we had uh, Nathan Lane. No, oh, wow. Incredible. Um, we had um, uh, 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 Zach Galifianakis was our season finale. He never does podcasts. Uh, we had Betty Thomas, who directed uh, some of your favorite comedies, like Tom. I, I remember her from uh, from Hill Street Blues. Hill That's Street Blues. Blues. But then That's she did Brady Bunch movie, and she did uh, the Howard Stern Private Parts, and she became a blockbuster comedy director. Yes. The, the first um, uh, Mr. Doolittle, Dr. Doolittle with uh, Eddie Murphy, she directed that one. Uh -huh. uh, great unsung hero. Uh, who and, uh, you had Joe Esterhaus. He has, uh, was that last season? That was the first season. We literally flew out to Cleveland to, to get his, uh, his take on uh, Showgirls and uh, Basic Instinct. That was amazing. We, right. haven't, we haven't flown anywhere. But we had Richard Donner. I, I was just going to say, two, the two that I, that I listened to this week were, um, I did the Richard Donner, which was just absolutely fascinating. I want to get to that one in a second. So but... Good. Harry Hamlin yes. was, I just, I don't remember. I, 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 first of all, I mean, I, I totally remember, like you, that electric jolt of sitting in the theater and watching Clash of the Titans and mm. seeing that face in the, and mm. him in that little skirt. My and first the, love affair. The yeah. first, I mean, just, I mean, what a, what a man. Yeah. What a man. Yes. And, we talk, you talk a little bit about his career and what it just what an odd path he's chosen for himself um, to follow up Clash of the Titans with uh, Making Love. Right. Which was another just seminal moment in my childhood where just like, what? Yeah, where he played this hot writer, uh, gay, uh, you know, he was a, a kind of a real like man about town with a different lover every night and he made no apologies for it. And it was so cool. And it was 1982, and it was a Fox movie, and um, it was a really cool movie, actually. And, and AIDS had not bubbled up yet, so there wasn't the inevitable end where he he died. He just there's actually a scene where he meets his lover, Michael Ankeen, a doctor, and they're discussing a bump under his neck, and you're like, here it comes. But no, it was an ingrown hair, and then they fall in love and have sex. I know that moment. I saw a screening of Making Love about a year ago, and Harry was there, as was uh, one of the writers. It really is. I remember that scene exactly. Like you think, like oh my god, it's an AIDS movie. It's like no, it's before AIDS. Yeah, right. yeah. It, it sort of the the movie almost ended his career, and yeah. I remember very specifically when Kate Jackson was on the Tonight Show and she was promoting the movie, and she said, um, uh, as she was talking about the movie, and then she said, and it's a gay love affair, and the audience booed and hissed oh. her. And it yeah. was one of those, like, I remember just the shame I felt watching that and just what, what a crazy moment that was. But then he managed to, you know, rebound 
And, um, you know, L.A. Law, Sexiest mm -hmm. Man Alive. Mm -hmm. um, I remember hit Veronica Mars. I remember, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, mm -hmm. he's had, um, and then Mad Men, of course. Uh, yeah. But what was your takeaway from him? Well, and then another thing, he had an affair with Ursula Andress. Oh, right, the yeah. The original Bond girl and had a baby, a love child. They met on the set of, of Clash of the Titans. So his, his agent said, well, since you like knocked up a Bond girl, then you can take the gay role. No one will mistake you for gay. But it, <laughs> but it killed his career, his movie career anyway. No one would call him. Why did he do it? Why, why did he take the role? He's a really iconoclastic, cool guy, and he never, he didn't play by Hollywood rules. Everyone wanted him to do things, and he would say, no, I'm doing this. And uh, he just thought it was a good part, and it was a good part. I mean, it was yeah. just brave, you know? Another reason why he almost destroyed his career was he was with Sue Mengers uh, in the 19, late 1970s, the super agent. And yeah. um, she, he, he was his... Uh, least famous he was her least famous uh client mm -hmm. and at one point he just went into sue menger's office and said this isn't working i'm leaving and she flipped out yeah because nobody did that to sue menger's yeah and then he was offered something called the clint at warner brothers which was the clint eastwood deal where you're guaranteed three movies and this and that and they were all setting him up to be you know the next major male movie star and he walked away from that or at least that's his version so I don't know. I just thought he was super cool and smart, and, and we're still he, talking about him. He still looks good. He, still he looks, looks good. good, and you know, I I don't really follow his Real Housewives exploits, so I know he has a whole new audience through that. But for me, he was just uh, like you said, just this childhood awakening of just mm -hmm. oh, this incredible man. I was really into him. One of your other um, podcasts that, that really stuck with me was the Richard Donner one, who was yeah. the uh, director of uh, Superman and Superman 2. That has nothing to do with the Donner party and people eating each other, correct? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's for our audience. <laughs> um, but I, you had a lot of really fun um, anecdotes in that. One thing I didn't know was it, you talk about how um, Richard Donner was talking about how uh, when they finally found, after this extensive castings call looking for Superman, they finally get to Christopher Reeve, and he's this skinny little kid mm. with, with like brown hair and looks absolutely. But they saw something in him, and so they they got him. Um, you know, they got him on an exercise routine with uh, Chewbacca. What was it, Peter? Right. Uh, Peter Mayhew. Yes. But then we got all this mail from like nerds who loved the interview, but we're like, that's wrong. It was David Prowse. It was, it was a, a oh. Darth Vader trained him, not oh, Peter oh. Mayhew. And I was like, the, you know, the guy's 90, give him a break. You know, well, yeah. he was so, he would, but he was so on, on it. He was he's so, so he was on it. And he's prepping, he had boards up for a lethal weapon five with little index cards and plot points. And he's still going. 90 Maybe. years old and, and smarter and more on it than any any one of the four of us. Yes, for sure. Seth, do, do you uh, have a dream? Do you have a dream person you want to go out to next? Can you a, say uh, it? a dream person, yeah. Present company excluded. Why am I why is no one jumping to mind right now? But I do have a long I'll come back to on and, that. And, I, I, you, I have have whole, you have the whole hour to think about it. And yeah. um, you're on this week because your podcast is brilliant and amazing, and you can catch um, it happened in Hollywood, everywhere your podcasts are. But you're here also because it's something this week's countdown of the top of things that make us go wow. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like vaguely Hollywood themed. And so we're going to move on to number nine now to talk about number nine Hollywood. And when I say Hollywood, of course, I'm referring to the uh, Ryan Murphy series. And I want to, before we start on this, I want to say that one of my reasons for getting Seth on the show was because um, I agree with Seth 98.5% of the time, I think. And I have done the math. I figured it out. And it's 1.5% that I disagree with you. And when I disagree with you, I like, I, 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 I've had it. I have and had it. on today. So at nine, <laughs> we're going to talk about, at number nine and number eight, we're going to talk about Ryan Murphy's Hollywood. Not only Ryan Murphy, with his genius, with his Barnum and Bailey kind of like show and genius, can come up with a topic that deserves two slots of <laughs> People who love, love, love Hollywood, the miniseries. There's many people I know, and people that have a lot of, let's just say, James saying James criticisms about it. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, do you love it? Is that what's happening? I you did. I, I loved it. I, I was. It was a welcome reprieve. There's two things that got me through 
quarantine. One is, and I'm not saying this to suck up, but Drag Race has gotten me through Fridays. You just it's true, make it's it true. to Friday, you can watch Drag Race, and you can smile and forget about your troubles. And then, to my surprise, because I wasn't expecting much uh, from Hollywood, I was really uh, taken with it. It was color. It was everything sort of Drag Race is positive and colorful and creative and sexy and silly. And I, I'm just surprised you were so anti. I, what's well, what, James, what? I know, something positive, James? I know it's hard for you. <laughs> no, I, but I will say that it does tick off a lot of boxes of things that I love. It's old Hollywood gossip. It is gay gossip. It is uh, the Scotty Bowers story, which I love, love, love. It's Rock Hudson in his early years and that the whole story about the, the, the um, who is the, the guy? Eddie Wilson. Right, yeah, Eddie Wilson. It is Holland Taylor and Patty Lupone. I love, love, love. And it is Hot Guys. So why do I hate it so much? Well, if I, I, I love know. all those things about it, why do I hate it? Yeah, so you're doing, you're doing my job for me. What? <laughs> People, I, I do find the opening, I've seen three of them, the opening title sequence, which is all these young actors that you've just, just like, like climbing the back of the, of the fictional Hollywood sign or, or, or made up to get to the top is quite moving. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's cool, it's, right? Yeah. yeah. It's an opening sequence that I do not fast forward through, which is very rare, especially on Netflix. Yeah, also, even the like title sequence. And Whistle Story is something that's, that yeah. I think is fabulous and should be talked about. Costumes, art direction, the interiors, everything is like... Eye candy. No, but, no expense was spared. You have that kind clearly. of clearly. And but, then turning turning Paramount into this Ace Studios and everyone standing at the gate waiting to be chosen. I just I'm a sucker for all that stuff. Right. I would be too. I'm a little bit with James. I can't get through it. So James, let's move on to we heard what's positive, what people like Hollywood, <laughs> and there's many James. Number eight. Good actor. Eight. The lead the lead hunky actor. Great, difficult role. Maybe, you know, surprisingly, uh, it's it, difficult to do, but he pulled it off, I think. The, 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 the Rock Hudson character. No, 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 I didn't love the Rock Hudson guy because he didn't remind me of Rock Hudson. Well, but I, God, I have to, the Noel Coward character is some sort of travesty of no, it's like, maybe I'm partial. Like, I just, I was just so appalled by the person they had playing Noel Coward and how sort of awful it was. And, yeah. And that, with me because I felt so much of it was just lazy, paint by numbers, one cliche after another. I was, and there's a line, God, I love it when you talk like a mogul. I mean, come on. It's like, it was like, <laughs> I'm still watching it, by the way. And I'm like, like for, <laughs> I, the, the dance of a seven veils, I thought, I cannot. I was like, it's, I was so talk about what's his name, Jim Parsons. Yeah. The Jim guy Parker, who plays yes. the evil agent who molds Rock Hudson and does this hideous dance. It, it was such a great a sleazy yeah, agent that preys on young, beautiful gay men and makes them into stars based on a real character. He's really, his performance is really effective. I thought, so yeah, I thought it was terrible. I'm sorry. Okay, James, now rip it up. Rip it then, okay. My big problem with the show, and this is something that Fenton and I have talked about at length, where I find it dangerous to inject. Uh, fantasy into history. And I think that in these Trumpian Orwellian times when black is night and, you know, black is white and night is day, that the idea that we are showing this, this fantasy utopia where the gays are, are in charge and the women are in charge and there's no sort of racial problems and um, the whole- well, They're easily surmountable, which is kind of the message. Yeah, there, there's really no homophobia. In, in, and I just think that in 50 years, people will look at this and think that maybe that's what the 30s were like. And I don't, I just find it dangerous. I think that we need to stick to, and especially right now, the facts are the facts and we need to put, we need to have them always in place in, in historical shows. And it's funny because I don't have that same problem with the great. You know, <laughs> the great is the same thing where you have history. all the fantasy elements in history. But I think that's the difference between 1930s and 1760s, probably. And it's not history that involves you, James. It's like the Tsars in Russia is a long time ago, right? And Hollywood is, here you are, you're living in Hollywood, you know? Maybe. James, do you have any thoughts on that about, about the idea of injecting fantasy into, into history? Well, I always think, you know, uh, Tarantino is the one it got compared to a lot. Well, and uh, and I have no issue. I have no problem with it. I actually think it's a really interesting 
uh, way to make uh, old material seem fresh. Okay, and, and the thing about Tarantino is, and I completely agree with you, that when he did it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and he gave the love letter to Hollywood and rewrote history about Charles Manson, I thought that was beautiful, and I thought it was beautifully done because Tarantino is a master technician, and he in when he does it, he knows what he's doing. I think in lesser hands, then it, you start to dilute it a little bit, and then the hacks who follow are even less, you know, in, uh, less uh, in tech te technicians than Ryan Murphy and Tarantino. And I think that by the time it gets down to, to you know, cartoons, it's just going to be chaos. And I just don't, I, I agree with you that I think that Tarantino did a good job. We produced a lot of uh, LGBTQ themed and cast programming at World of Wonder. And I find sometimes that people attack it from the LGBTQ community because it doesn't tell exactly their story or, so I wonder if some of this is, is our sensitivity as gay men to the fact that our story, which is still very sensitive to us is being uh, fictionalized and therefore misrepresented when we wouldn't have that same scrutiny necessarily on Sharon Tate and that kind of thing. I, I don't know. It's, it's a uh, Ryan Murphy never ceases to sort of just hit the jugular, you know, just like totally tap into what people respond to. I worry a little bit. That's a little bit exposition heavy. That's there's, they're trying to do so much that it kind of flies through. That's my two and a half episode in. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a great party there in a scene and the guy says, this is this decor is by William Haynes. And William Haynes was a famous decorator who used to be an actor <laughs> and, then he was gay, and he became an interior designer. It's like, come on. And then you you pull out and the, it isn't even William Haynes stuff in the room. I, <laughs> but, but I did find out one really interesting thing I was, the, the story of Peg Entwistle has always sort of fascinated me. And did you know she was only ever in one film? She only ever appeared in one film. Uh, I think it's called The 13. And that's and the woman who jumped off, the famous woman actress who jumped yeah. off the Hollywood the whole of the thing, and, the, and not to give it away, but the, they they making the film of Peg's jumping off, and they, a woman takes over the studio. They cast a black woman to play the role. There's a half-Asian guy directing it. All the gays are in all the roles. And... And they like decide, oh, what if she doesn't kill herself after all? Which I, I just thought that was all brilliant. But it was interesting to me that Peg, uh, the part that she played in the one movie she was in, she played a lesbian. Really? In real life. Was yeah. that meant to be a lesbian? And, 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 and her part was dramatically cut down. And, the, and that film wasn't in fact released until after her death. Wow. Huh. Didn't know that. A little bit of yeah. Well, see, now I agree that, that the story of Scotty Bowers, if they would have just done a whole series about Scotty Bowers, that would have been fascinating. A whole story about Peg Entwistle. I, I, I just think that they could have been broken up into three different series. You know, the um who is the Asian uh, anime Wong. Uh mm -hmm. like that deserves a whole series as well, you know, mm -hmm. and what happened to her. Writing the book. Start writing the book now. In six years we'll have a mini series. James <laughs> James <laughs> Hollywood. All right, we're going to take a break. Um, Blake, have you got a question for us? Today is May 29th. Today is also the birthday of which famous member of the Jackson family? I know. Mm -hmm. All right, you're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. Before we take a break, I'll just tell you, all new season, RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars premieres next week. That's June 5th at 8 p.m. We'll be right back. Agreed. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton Bailey, joined by James St. James, Tom Campbell, Blake Jacobs, and our very special guest, Seth Abramovich, has returned. Yay! We're doing the vaguely Hollywood-themed countdown of the top 10 things that make us go wow. wow. We had a question before the break, Blake. Yes, which member of the Jackson family has a birthday today? I'm going to say Jermaine. I'm going to say Rebe. Oh. I'm drinking champagne. It's Latoya. Oh, Latoya. That's the obvious. Um, it's Rebe. It is Rebe. Rebe. Congrats, Rebe. James. Thank you. I just, I just pulled that out of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> How old is Rebe or is that in It's like also life? Latoya's birthday. Wait, they're both, they have the same birthday? Yes. Well, I, I liked every minute of it. Thank you. And Jermaine? 
No? Okay. No, not me. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> there should be a Jackson series by Ryan Murphy, I think. <laughs> What's next? Did you Change see the, the, the Love of the Gloves thing? <laughs> the, the show, the one-man show? Or no, the, the puppet show thing? No. No. no, what was that? It was a musical that was it told the story of Michael Jackson through the point of view of his glove, and his oh, glove yes. was a puppet. And it, it was, was on Broadway, wasn't it? No, it was like down in like like no man's land here in LA. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was uh, interesting. You so saw it? I saw it, yeah. So the glove knows what it's like to be fisted by Michael Jackson. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> There's many good jokes like that. <laughs> Like, but uh, it didn't get into this like the pedophilia stuff so much. It was more about how Donny Osmond stole his career, basically, which is apparently true, or like tried to by becoming the white version of him. Really? Yeah, it was interesting. It had huh. interesting. I was watching some old Donny Osmond and the Osmond Brothers clips from the Andy Williams shows from the '60s, and I just want to say, Donny was cute as pie. So cute, so cute. Before the Jackson Five, just. In defense of Don. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the pandemic. I'm watching a lot of YouTube. We'll give you a break. <laughs> number seven. Number seven. The number one. I've it told us the number one rated show on cable. Snowpiercer, the um, TV adaptation of um, Bong Joon Ho. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Parasite. Who directed the Oscar award-winning Paradise, Paris, Paradise, Parasite. <laughs> Phantom of the Parasite. Uh, but funnily enough, I have you seen it, Seth? Have you seen Snowpiercer? Well, I saw the movie. I haven't seen the show yet. Yeah, I started, there's two episodes of the show have been on air. Uh, Jennifer Connelly's in it, and I think she's really great. She's kind of like the conductress of the train. And David Diggs, who was in Hamilton, he's kind of mm -hmm. like the protagonist. So, um, yeah. So I think two episodes, and funny enough, watching those two made me so, I was like, I've got to know this story. And I went and watched Snowpiercer the movie because I've never seen Snowpiercer the movie. I saw like the first few minutes up until uh, Tilda Swinton appears. And then I was like, oh, this is, I was like, I didn't get it. And so the, last night I watched the whole movie and I love that movie. It's so bizarre. Well Strange, have you seen it, James? Yes, I, um, it was one of my favorite movies of the last 10 years. I think it's absolutely brilliant and so great. And I love Tilda Swinton in it. I think she's hysterical. Yeah. And that's, I, I think the movie is so perfect unto itself that I don't know why we need six seasons of a, of a series around it. I just, I don't, I don't get it. What, what do you think about the series? I think the series, well, I just think the whole idea of, the, the, it's a train, right? So the earth has been frozen in a mishap. Uh, they did the wrong thing, cure global warming. And so the whole place went into a deep freeze. I interestingly, this whole story is based on a graphic novel from 1982, French graphic novel called Transperse Neige, which I suppose is Snowpiercer in French. Anyway, <laughs> what I found fascinating about the train, and this is where I disagree with you, James, where I think it can be a series that goes on and on and on and on, is that the train, which is a thousand and one carriages long, is a completely enclosed ecosystem. And last week we were talking about uh, Ecosphere, the um, spaceship Earth, the documentary about the, the completely closed experiment they did in Arizona. And this is sort of the fantasy version of that. So you go along the train and there's every environment, every habitat, there's the nightlife environment, there's the spa environment, there's the, the sort of third class grungy environment. And it's you realize that it's sort of like, a, it's almost like you could be dead and you're in heaven and it's some sort of Dante-like, instead of circles of hell, it's carriages of hell. And they're making their way to try and find God, who presumably is the person in carriage number one. It's really... It it's sounds really, a lot like a love boat to me. <laughs> it is like love boat, yes. But I just think the idea of it, it's such a... Have you, you haven't watched it then, James. No, I haven't. And do you think you will? Maybe. It depends on how long this quarantine goes on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I remember was that it was a, a story about class struggle because yeah. all the, the poor people were in the back trying to push to the front. Yes, it is. And the whole sort of justification is that everybody has their place in this system and that the engine is eternal. I mean, it's a little bit artsy-fartsy, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but it, <laughs> and a bit violent, <laughs> too. But anyway, I can't. I, I that Snowpiercer the movie. I rented it on Amazon Prime, 
And Snowpiercer, the series, is on TNT every week, Sunday and night. you see that Jennifer Connelly is really good? She's really good. And the outfits that they have for the train conductresses are really kind of cool. Cut outfits. And it's just so neat. It's just, I think it, in a COVID time, it's one of those things that makes perfect sense. We're in this enclosed environment. We're all trapped in limited space, feeling claustrophobic. And it is very much the that idea of the haves and have nots comes into very sharp focus. So it does feel particularly timely. And I suppose the other thing is that fantasy or not, an enclosed ecosphere, there's only one way down. You know, things are running out, things are breaking. It feels very dystopian in a way that things feel right now. All right, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> number six. Number six. Um, I want to sort of give this one over to Seth for a minute, too, because I know we both watched the Natalie Wood documentary on HBO. And yeah. um, I, I found it fascinating, and I also found it a little frustrating. But I want you to give me your take on it. Yeah, I had a mixed take on it. I, I, I For the first uh, maybe like 20 minutes of it, I was very into it. I guess because it had so much personal footage of Natalie Wood and her family and you know, you know them. I mean, I think the point of it was to try to get it away from all the, the theorizing about her death and all the murder theories and everything and just try to make her more human. So it was done by her daughter. And um, and so I was very into that. And again, lots of scenes of Hollywood, you know, golden age of Hollywood and uh, dating with uh, Daddy Wagner, as they call him, Robert Wagner. Um, but then uh, there was issues, one with the construction of it, it kept kind of flopping around in time. So you actually watch her die twice. Like you get to the boat and she dies and you're like, oh, that's horrible. And then like like about an hour into it, you get to the boat again and she dies again. And you're like, how many times are they gonna like do this? And then the other was that it was clearly told, you know, from the from the family's point of view. So it didn't feel like a, like a real documentary. It felt like a personal, H hagiography or however you pronounce that. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, that was, I have hagiography right, written right in bold letters right yeah. here. Yeah, yeah, no one did anything wrong. Everyone was just the best and it was perfect. Um, um, so it gets a little dull after a while to watch that. I, I lost interest towards the end. Uh, I agree with you in that um, I loved all the early stuff where you watch her transition from a child star into doing some yeah. in the grass and rebel without a cause and, and um, uh, West Side Story. Um, and then I loved seeing all the, where, where they kept trotting out Robert Redford and Mia Farrow and Elliot Gould and Jill St. John. Yeah. I interviews, all the interviews or old pick footage or both? No, they have new interviews new with interview. Robert Redford and Mia Farrow. And they, so, so the, the Gregson Wagner family trots out all these people to sort of lift up the, the, the documentary. But I feel like the whole thing is, uh, the whole documentary is just an excuse for the family to exonerate uh, Robert Wagner. Yeah. And well, that it well. was maybe to put out into the public what his defense would be if it ever goes to trial. You know, yeah. like you get the feeling that it really was just an excuse, not an excuse to celebrate Natalie, but more of an excuse to uh, exonerate Robert if Wagner. If I were trying to prosecute Mr. Wagner, you know what I would show? Hours and hours of heart to heart. <laughs> every, every series, Amoida, Amoida, um, Jonathan, help! <laughs> I um, I want to say something controversial because I knew you guys were talking about this. I haven't seen the documentary, and when I think of Natalie Wood, I go ah oh, inside because I think of Rebel Without a Cause. I think of uh, uh, the Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. I think of, but like she, I also watch a lot of Turner Classic movies, and she made, forgive me, a lot of shitty movies in the sixties or movies that don't hold up. Would you agree with that? I know the big ones. Like, I don't, I probably didn't see a lot of these lousy ones. I although, watched one. Although, uh, 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 Bob and Carol and Ted, Ted and Alice, which they talk about, is actually really good. And um, that was her project. She pushed it through and it did really well at the box office mm -hmm. and uh, gave her some power. That was what impressed me was not uh, appreciating, like, sort of what a kind of feminist. Uh, you know, uh, kind of mogul she became within the in, within the system, and um, how she managed to just sort of drive her own projects, and she had yeah. she was in charge of her career for almost from the you know very beginning. Yeah, she um, went head to head with Jack uh, Wa with um, Warner, Jack Warner, because who had her uh, under contract, and she uh, she got basically she went on strike, 
until she was allowed to pick one project a year. And that's pretty impressive for that era to yeah. for a young actress to do that. So I did learn a lot about her and I, and I was very impressed. One of my favorites is Inside Daisy Clover. The circus is a wacky place. How oh, I love it with Robert. What Robert Redford is gay. She He's gay him. in it. Yeah. Yeah. Which was, I mean, first of all, Robert Redford gay is just, that was talk about a seminal moment for me when I saw right. that. And also just that he's so beautiful and that just at the height of his beauty. Yeah, they got new interviews with him as well. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a good movie for reminding you of what aging does, but. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> I have this Zoom call for that. Back and forth, but, uh, but yeah, no. Yeah, he was really beautiful, man. So do we, do, we, do we think that everybody should see the documentary? Should Tom watch it because he's the biggest young old Hollywood fan? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's worth worth your time, definitely. I'm going to put it on late at night, and if I fall asleep after the first part, I won't feel bad. Because you said right. the first part. Yeah, you can, you can wait till the first time she dies, and you don't have to wait <laughs> around for the second time she dies. All right, so that's Watch <laughs> Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind on HBO. And a number five... Number five. I want to talk to you about The Imagineers on Disney Plus, which is another documentary, documentary series made by the family. It's not made by Disney uh, descendants directly, but it's actually directed by Leslie Iwerks, who is the granddaughter of, I don't have to say his name, Oob, Oob Iwerks. Oh, Oob, Oob Iwerks, right. Mickey Mouse. Yeah. She's obviously Disney royalty. Um, one of the great families of Disney who worked with Disney all along. And this is a six part series all about the Imagineers of Disney. And my God, I got to tell you, well, after we saw, I, I showed Nolan the Great on Hulu and it was a little bit racy for a 13 year old. So I thought we should calm things down a bit. <laughs> and so we're watching this. Um, but it's really fascinating. And yes, a lot of it is only Disney would make this about Disney. So you're not going to get a lot of. Um, inside scandal although they're quite negative about michael eisner and they're quite open about their sort of mishits when they tried to build parks on the cheap and things but it's absolutely fascinating i didn't realize for example that it's a small world one of the sort of quintessential attractions was built for the world's fair in 1964 and that after it had debuted there then they took it back to disney world and also i didn't realize or had forgotten that Pirates of the Caribbean, before it was a multi-movie franchise, started life as an amusement ride at Disney. And it's really fascinating to see how Walt Disney built the first one. I think it was like, I think it, in today's dollars, in 1959, it cost him 160 million to build the first Disney. And it was like, the opening day was chaos and people were very disgruntled and and then they went on to create Epcot, Disney World, um, you know, which has its own, uh, I think, I, I sort of feel that it must have been the inspiration for Westworld, the original Westworld. Because <laughs> under, under Disney World, they built what they call a utilidor, which is everything you access by corridors. You can access the staff, the team, or the cast. Yeah. I think they're called, the cast can access the attractions by walking along the corridors underground and then popping up, ta-da! Which I think you would like, James. I think that's all sort of a... <laughs> that's how we get around teenager, now. <laughs> when I was a teenager, my family kept trying to get me a job at Disney World, but um, uh, that, that was like their big goal for me to get a summer job there. And uh, But you had to cut your hair a very specific way uh, to work at Disney World. It had to, you had to be very preppy. And I was going through a long haired perm phase and I would not get my hair cut. So, but I, I remember taking the tour of Disney World and do it, the underground t tunnels and everything. And it is just fascinating. It really is. And they, you know, um, they launched Disney cruises and they, when they built those, the two cruise, the Disney cruise ships, they were the two longest cruise ships in the world at that time. They were so long that, in fact, they had to build them. They built them in two sections and then stuck them together. Um, just stuff like that. It's just like fascinating details to see the way they gradually built and built and built the theme park. And and I love the fact that they just admit to their missteps along the way. It, it's pretty. It's pretty epic. Anything I'm, about his um, anti-Semitism? You know, it's funny. No, I wonder <laughs> what. <laughs> what about his frozen head? No. <laughs> yeah. 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 
So that's uh, the Imagineers uh, streaming on Disney Plus. Should we take a break? I've got a question, and some of you may know it, but I thought it was very interesting and gay. <laughs> just what, like me, Blake. Just like me. What music legend recently had a rhinestone undergarment sell for almost forty thousand dollars? I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy, and we'll have the answer when we come back. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with James St. James and Tom Campbell and Blake and our superstar guest, Seth Abramovich. Hi. Hello. Um, your podcast, season two, right? Your podcast, it happened in Hollywood? Yeah, we ended uh, season two. Uh, we got it just under the wire before lockdown started. And uh, we'll have season three up in uh, January of 2021. If we oh. make it to January of 21. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to be optimistic that we will. <laughs> but until then, you can catch up on everything you've missed. Yeah, that's right there. I love, a pod- I love the podcast. Live forever. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's talk about the uh, rhinestone panties. Blake, what was the question? What music legend recently had a rhinestone undergarment sell for almost $40,000? It was actually 30,000 pounds. I'm going to say Dolly Parton. I'm going to say Kenny Loggins. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Kenny you know Loggins. this. Do you know Fenton? You guest. Yeah. Elvis Presley. <laughs> yeah, Ryan Stone Jock Strap. Is that true? Yes. Oh, it was they, Elvis? It was yeah. Elvis, yeah. They A showed it on television and they said he wore it all through the 70s. I happen to be a bit of an aficionado on the strap of jock, and I don't think he, it looked like it was barely ever worn. It wasn't worn in, you know, like I'm telling you, like, okay, I'll stop. Especially late 70s, our Elvis. You yeah. know, there'd be like lots of sweat stains and stuff on Stretchy, stretchy. But yeah, any, yeah, I don't sweat know. Sweat stain. Yeah. They didn't say who the money was going to. It wasn't for charity, I don't think. It was just like Lisa Marie needs some cash. <laughs> 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 Okay, we're counting down the top 10 things that made us go, wow. We have a sort of Hollywood theme. Tom, what's number four? Number four. I know you guys are incredible at looking at your televisions and taking in all this information. I have been, I've not been observing a lot of pop culture. I've been spending a lot of time looking out my window and something that's quintessentially Los Angeles right this time of year is the Jacaranda tree, which I have outside my window and people I, I work out with a trainer now in a park socially distanced wearing a max we do it at the um the tar pits early in the morning and there's so many jacarandas and it just reminds me how beautiful they are he's been here about five years he's never heard of jacarandas do you guys know the history of the jacaranda i no? do not i don't even know what it looks like it's the purple tree it's everywhere oh okay okay yeah the beautiful purple tree, there are streets that line with them. To me, I'm from New Hampshire, New England, and the, it's the equivalent of the lilac season. It bursts forward in May and June, and then it just goes away. Uh, and it leaves these beautiful, um, it, 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 all the little blossoms fall, and so it's like this purple shadow cast underneath the purple tree. I don't know. They're, 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 they're always on my car, and they always like <laughs> they stick to my car, and they get very, they're, they're annoying. In fact, in my research, it, it, it's believed that the, the leaves have sap in them that stick to your car, but that's not the fact. You know why they stick to your car, James? Why? Because uh, birds, uh, not birds, little um, insects feed on them, and after they feed, they poop the sticky stuff onto your car. I don't need to know little that. Little worms are just ejaculating all over your car, James. <laughs> <laughs> Is it getting hot in here? <laughs> At least somebody's ejaculating in my car. <laughs> we, Not me. Oh, I just want to let you know, we never give women seem to get the short end of the, uh, the stick when it comes to history. But Kate Sessions, who was a native Californian uh, born in 1857. 1857. That's very rare that there were, there were natural born Californians other than the, the natural Americans or the native born Americans. Her, her brothers and father came up with the gold rush. She was born in Northern California. She went to Berkeley. She, she moved uh, south and opened a flower shop. She was a horticulturist. And she's responsible for bringing all these different species of flowers and trees 
two of the Southern California in California, including the Jacaranda, which originates from South America. And she's also responsible. She, she made, um, there was this tract of really awful land in uh, San Diego. So she um, vowed to the city that she would plant 100, 300 trees and then 100 trees every year. And that tract of land is now called Balboa Park. So I just want to, I think they're beautiful. I don't know, they take my breath away. I guess you guys don't even notice. But Kate Sessions, thank you for the Jacaranda trees. Talk about sort of like a Johnny Appleseed story of somebody who, uh, who brought us uh, so much, I don't know. You know? They, they're not really perfumed, are they? They don't really have a bouquet. Or do no, they? unlike unlike the lilac, there's no there's no oh. delicious uh, fragrance. But they're so beautiful, and I have them right out my window, so I, I love them. You know, I live near Echo Park, and, and before they shut it down to, to renovate it, you know, there's the lake with the lotus blossoms, and someone illegally took some of them and, and uh, did whatever people do in their labs to, like, maintain a species. There's a word for that, but I'm forgetting it. And... Um, when they reopened it, because of this person who did this illegally, they were able to to replenish these lotus blossoms, which came from China, huh. and um, and now they're you know very plentiful in the Echo Park Lake, and it's because of this gorilla guy who took samples and did it at home. So, a lot of uh, green thumbs in LA doing wonderful things. Chakarandas. they are beautiful. They really are, they're sort of alien. It's like it's like being on a sci-fi planet, you know. Seeing yeah. a purple tree, like who so. What it does smell good? Is it? Is it the uh, jasmine? Yeah. 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 Night blooming jasmine. I like to say night mm -hmm. blooming jasmine. Now become Ruby Flanahan. Night blooming jasmine. Because they Williams. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's go to number three, James. Number three. I have been getting so much crap on the WOW report and on Facebook because I wrote a story recently about Richard Madden. Richard Madden from Game of Thrones, from Cinderella, from The Bodyguard, from Rocket Man, just handsome, handsome gentleman, right? And he, uh, it, during the quarantine, during lockdown, he has been spending it with a friend named um, Froy Gutierrez, Gutierrez um, from Teen Wolf. And uh, the way it has been said in different um, articles in different newspapers is that it always says, uh, Richard Madden and his new friend, Froy Gutierrez, which is the way I say it. And I always mention that before this, uh, Richard Madden was friends with 13 Reasons Why Brandon Flynn. And I'm giving it, I, I'm not insinuating that there's any relationship there. That there's anything I think that's the definition of insinuation. I'm just saying he has a friend and he's living with this friend and he's roommates with this friend. And people are saying that I am outing him and what the, who cares what the relationship is and how dare I insinuate anything, blah, blah, blah. But my thought is that Hollywood, people have been reporting on Hollywood relationships straight for, for you know, 100 years now. And what difference is it between me saying that he has a relationship with this guy is than saying that, you know, uh, Marilyn Monroe was dating someone? I mean, like, what? It, why am I in the wrong for doing this? Someone please help me. Seth, a, why is James a, in the wrong? It's disingenuous, James. <laughs> 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 That's why the hard is. You're not just reporting on a friendship. You're insinuating that they're a couple. But what does it matter if they are a couple? Why is there anything wrong with saying that these two people are a couple? Uh, well, if he's not out, then you're sort of, uh, or one might be insinuating that he is gay when he's not ready to come out. Right. Um, but, and, and this is something that I always struggle with because for years I worked at Outweek magazine in the early 90s, and I was at the forefront of outing when Michelangelo Signorelli first you know, coined the term. And I used to argue with him about it all the time. But then I came around to the fact that during the AIDS crisis, that it was important for gay people to be out and for, to, for people to, uh, to step up and own who they are because it was a life and death situation. And so since then, I've always sort of thought, like, why the fuck are you in the closet? Like, what, what do you, what, what, if, if you're comfortable enough to be out in public with this person and, and living with them, what, why aren't you comfortable enough saying that it's, it is what it is? Well, it's good timing because I've been working on, um, for this uh, gay pride issue of Hollywood Reporter, an oral history of coming out. Right. And I've talked to just about everyone you can think of, minus Elton and Ellen. But everyone else, Neil Patrick Harris, Lance Bass, 
all these people that were uh, Anderson Cooper were given a lot of F blank T for not coming out. Um, I got to get into their brains and see what were they, they were thinking. Well, um, yeah, and it's been fascinating. Let's go into Anderson Cooper because he was someone who frustrated me to no end because he wouldn't come out because and, and it wasn't until he had made his, you know, it had made his mark and, and no one was going to take it away from him that he felt comfortable coming out. And I would get frustrated with him for doing stories about bu LGBT bullying and not stepping up and saying, I am an LGBT person. And he could have added he could have helped people and he didn't. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to defend or put or say his words here. Um, you know, he had the added thing that he was going into dangerous parts of the world and he's a right, journalist, okay. not an actor. And I thought that was legitimate. And then also feeling that he didn't want to put too much of himself front forward. And then I think for a lot of these people, there is a reckoning at a certain point. It's either a suicide or some act of violence or something where they realized I can't just be an ally anymore. Right. Why right. Like said that to me. Um, that, you know, I got to step up and and this will make a big difference. And it takes a while. And then there's a lot of the things that keep other, you know, everyone in the closet, self-loathing, fear of how people are going to react. Uh, Clay Aiken told me that, you know, he, he hadn't told certain really basic people in his life, like his grandmother and things, and he, he didn't want them to find out through the media. So, but then it becomes this ridiculous tightrope, you know, jigsaw, whatever, pretzel of trying to, to like keep it out of interviews when the media has caught on and they aren't afraid to ask you. Well, so, so how is that any different for, for Richard Madden right now, who is walking that tightrope by being half in, half out? And uh, I just don't think kids care as much anymore. Like, I don't think it's as big a deal as it was 10, 20 years ago. Right, so okay. it's not really on their minds. So I'm feeling like the people that are probably giving you heat are probably younger. And they're saying like, why is this an issue to you? Whereas right. our generation, it was a huge issue, like, oh my God, you could do so much good. And and uh, I don't know, I don't know anything about Richard Maddy. I don't know if he is or isn't, like, I don't, I just don't know. Well, he's cool. I just, I, the really thing crazy. is about Richard is that I, I find him, I find him very attractive. I think that he's very good in everything that he does and I want to really like him and I want to, to be a fan. And this is just something that's sort of holding me back a little bit. Well, well it sounds like he's like nudging a toe out of the closet if he's sort of seen with these people and, not hiding so maybe it'll come soon i don't know my and feeling has always been like it's kind of your business i would right. never push someone out of the closet he's it, his boyfriends are his friends are always very attractive too they're he, he has very good taste in in friends well he has pretty good looks too so yes yes but i also think it's like it, it's a post as much as it's a political issue for society at large I think for each and every one of us, unlearning the institutionalized phobia, shame, hatred, you know, it takes a long time to get rid of that. Even if you're out and contentedly out amongst your social group, to actually make that statement and say, I am gay, I think is a whole different thing, given how much you're taught as children, or our generation certainly were taught as children, that the worst thing you could be is gay, you're a criminal, you're a pervert, you're sick, you know, well, you know stuff like that. Yeah, it takes a long time. And Hollywood to... likes to typecast you. So if he's enjoying, you know, leading straight men roles now and he comes out and they start to dry up, I could see that being a legit concern. It doesn't mean he's ashamed of who he is, but he wants to keep playing, keep, keep the mystery alive so he can play more characters. And which is why I also think, funnily enough, Ryan Murphy's Hollywood is, is doing a huge, is actually doing a huge public service in terms okay. of gay visibility. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's go to number two. Number two. I never saw yesterday. Did, did anyone here see yesterday? Yes. Why? What is that? <laughs> it was the worst movie, movie I've ever seen. <laughs> movie. It's a Richard Curtis, uh, Danny Boyle, British, you know, Notting Hill Gate, um, Love Always type movie with the premise that a songwriter is in the world and nobody remembers the Beatles. And so he finds success by strumming the hits of the Beatles, which no one else remembers. But there's a backstory to, do you know this, Seth, the backstory no. to uh, yesterday? It's written, the, the idea, of, well, the credit for the movie is um, Richard Curtis gets sole writing credit and story by credit. But in point of fact, it was a pitch for a movie called Cover Version, written by a guy called Jack 
Bart, B-A-R-T-H, who was 40 years in the business, 25 unproduced screenplays, and at the age of 62, he sells Cover Story, his first feature movie. And it is yesterday. And they buy it, uh, working title pictures buy it, and they say, look, you've never had a movie, so Richard Curtis needs sole writing credit. It's amazing, Richard Curtis, Danny Boyle, it's his dream-making team, you know, you gotta do this. So the writer very humbly goes along with it. And then is just sort of gradually written out of the whole process. I'm laughing, but it's a terribly poignant, sad story because in a way, the story of this guy's life, his career, mirrors the whole yesterday story that he wrote. And in his experience, the movie comes out, it's a huge hit, and he is like nowhere to be seen. Oh. So Richard Curtis is the guy who steals the Beatles songs in this instance. In, in this that instance. sort of sense. But, but, but what's lovely about this article, and we'll upload it to the web, it's on, on a website called Uproxx. Um, what's, what's lovely about this, you get to see, it's done in such detail, you get to see that it's not like people operating with bad intentions. It's the necessary machinery of marketing and they're gravitating towards the name. And Richard Curtis makes great play of the fact that he, he says he never read the original script. And he said, just, just let me write my own script from this one line premise, which is what he claims he did. But then there's some details like the movie, spoiler alert, the movie ends with um, nobody remembers Harry Potter, apparently. That's the next sort of potential it's huh. sort of sign up joke at the end of the movie. And as just so happens that that's the exact way the cover version, this original script ends. But Richard Curtis said Sarah Silverman gave him the idea. So it's, it's just, I actually, funny enough, the reason I even meant, I, this isn't actually about throwing shade at Richard Curtis. I just think it's a terribly poignant story about life imitating art. Um, and um, now makes me want to go see Yesterday. I, I've never seen it. I saw it. like it? Mm, no, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, can I spoil one part? <laughs> No, I shouldn't. I don't know. Should I? Know, I? Yes. I it's it's been John, Lennon, John Lennon shows up because he in this world that happens after like electrical storm or something. Like they even given a reason why it happened. Mm. Electrical storm. So John <laughs> Lennon shows up a, in a scene where he's never been killed. Anyway, whatever. It was not for me. Oh yeah. John John Lennon Lennon shows up. And he's living as an obscure fisherman, right? Yes, yes. It's really sappy. And uh, I'd rather learn, know the story of this 60-year-old uh, screenwriter. Well, that, that's another detail that was in the original script that was not that was also in the final version, which Richard Curtis says he never read. Poor guy. So there you go. I think this could be a Netflix series. <laughs> or Ryan Murphy. Yeah, rewrite it though. <laughs> right. Yes. Original writer gets all the attention. Yes. Yes. And he's very young. Full circle yeah. moment. Let's yeah. take a break. Richard Madden start. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. You're listening to Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. All right, welcome back to Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James St. James and Seth Abramovich. And we have reached that epic moment that only comes once a week when we reveal the number one thing that made us go wow this week. Number one. It can only be one thing tonight on VH1. The be I'm gonna say it, the best season of RuPaul's Drag Race, season 12, grand finale. And it's being, it has been shot remotely. So the Queens have, and their boyfriends and girlfriends and families have used their backyards and their closets. And they're, we're doing every beat, we're doing five lip syncs, we are doing uh, fashion show, we are doing Miss Congeniality, celebrities pop in. Well, Seth, you're our guest, you're a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. Yeah, super fan. If you have any questions, now is the time. Okay, let's get right to it. What was RuPaul wearing on the reunion thing? What, <laughs> what was that weird gimp mask and hoodie? <laughs> I just need to know what that was. Um, I think you're referring to <laughs> yeah. This now iconic look, which is going to <laughs> we're releasing today also uh the the Shady Bunch, which was the song that started the uh the 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 reunion and bring back my girl RuPaul's new thing. And we are capitalizing. It was the most talked about mask 
uh, since Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how much I should say, except that Rue was very invested in making sure the season continues and, and had, a, had an ultimate ending and wanted to respect the Queens. We also were instructed by the government, by Viacom, by production, by our insurance companies to be as safe and distant as possible. So everybody was locked up where they were. They couldn't go in the hallway. There were so many restrictions. And I think Rue feels like he's carrying on and drag the show must go on. But I think that he's just like, things aren't normal. Things aren't okay. And I'm not gonna just dress up or pretend that it is. So it's like, he was there with his whole heart and spirit. He was laughing, he was fun. He was very generous with all the Queens. But some, he just got it in his head. This is what he was doing visually. And there was no discussion. And I can't think of an outfit that would have gotten more of a response than that. <laughs> I'll never I forget it. Because I heard that he was paid $500,000 by Slick It Up to wear. I like that. I like that. <laughs> by the way, it was it was a pajama theme party. And it was a whole purple onesie, which we neglected to show him. So everybody thought he was wearing Justin Bieber's purple hoodie from I did look like Justin Bieber's hoodie. <laughs> and you ain't seen, in terms of spoiler alert, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you thought that was interesting, look, for the reunion, wait till you see what he's wearing for the finale. Okay. No, okay. you're God in heaven. I'm scared. Max Headroom meets the gay blade. I've been leaving that. <laughs> oh, wow. A rubber mask? Is he wearing a rubber mask? I don't know if it's rubber. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, do you, have you enjoyed this season now that I've hyped it beyond you, uh, your comparison? Yeah. I, I love this season. And I uh, I even sent fan mail to Crystal Method, who's my favorite. I, love I, I haven't heard back yet, but I, I check every day. I um, For a long time, it was between Crystal Method and Gigi. And now I am firmly in the Crystal Method uh, fan base. I, I Crystal love Method just fan. oozes cool in and out of drag. I just yes. want to be her best friend. There mm -hmm. could be three more different queens with different yeah. styles and approaches to drag because it's Gigi Good, who's so young and so fashion forward and ridiculously charismatic. There's Crystal Method, who came from you know, her story. She was sort of in the bottom and moved her way up. And she, uh, uh, I, I won't give it away, but her outfits are ridiculous in the best yeah. way. And 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 you guys don't sleep on Jada Essence Hall. There's a huge chance Jada Essence Hall is walking away with the crown tonight. She's classic drag. She's smart. She's out there. Things just seem come so naturally to her. And she's beautiful. So I really I'm not even sure who won. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm waiting to find out. I, I would be happy with any one of those three. But yeah. But let's yeah. face it, Heidi in Closet is the one who is going to have the <laughs> Heidi, oh, now that is a star. I mean, yeah. that is somebody. I I love her so much. I would just want, I just want to hug her every time. I talk, talk about wanting to be someone's best friend. Yeah. 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 If she doesn't walk away with Miss Congeniality, I, I will eat my hat. I will eat my wig. There are no winners on RuPaul's Drag Race. They don't have to be. We, we celebrated Victoria Park, uh, Porkchop Parker once again as the center square of our Shady Bunch uh, opening on, on, on the reunion. So, you know, you're always remembered, always always in our hearts. Well, this many trace in forever. How many people audition? Like, how do you find, you know, because it's a, a, quite a talent pool, and I'm just wondering how many people audition to get on this season. I think it's the most, I don't know the exact numbers, and we do employ a casting company who does all of the initial screening for us. But, you know, the, the, the amount of energy the Queens put into their tapes is remarkable. We're, we're we are greedy mofos in terms of they have to do like a lip sync, they have to do characters, they have to show us wardrobe, they have to do you know so many things, and so uh, it's it's hundreds and hundreds, close to a thousand probably every year, and it grows every year uh, because drag people are more and more into drag and and into expressing it and not afraid to let their freak flag fly high. And when they, sorry, they come with these outfits like the, like the ones that go home. That they probably have all these great outfits that never get seen, right? Oftentimes, yes. I mean, there's 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 definitely fashion challenges that are that where they make things from scratch, and those are outlined. And sometimes it's stuff that they've brought uh, with them. They'll know some 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 runway themes and stuff like that. And sometimes they change their mind and they make things right there, or augment or borrow wigs. I mean, it really is an amazing it's an amazing uh, life experience to observe. I can't imagine. What it's like to be part of that, you know. And there's be, actually a show for that. What you pack and Michelle Visage, right? Thank you very much. There is that. Yes, Seth. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna have to love you and leave you. Okay. Uh, Great seeing you guys. Watch uh, you. Triple's Drag Race season twelve finale tonight. Uh, all will be revealed. And yes, Blake is right. You can watch What You Pack in 
And also, you know, Michelle Versace has her own talk show now, which you can watch on Wow Presents Plus, called uh, How's Your Head, Hun? It's on every Tuesday night. It's made in, uh, she's in lockdown with her family, with, with the lovely David and her daughter, Lily, and the dogs, and- Lola. Lola. Lily, Lily. No, it's Lola. Lily. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry. Lily's off to college. Lola's about to go to college. That's right. She just graduated. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. Um, all right, James. Thank you very much for joining us, James. Are you still with us? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> and Tom and Blake, uh, stay home. Don't go out, but do something that makes the world go well. See you same time, same place next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.